Welcome to the Plant Cunning Podcast, where we explore a relationship to plants, other people, and the mysteries of nature. Coming to you from the High Allegheny Plateau in central New York, we are your hosts, A.C. Staubel and Isaac Hill. Episode 61, Matthew Wood on Holistic Medicine and the Extracellular Matrix. Matthew Wood is an herbalist, author, an educator, who has written such classic works as The Earthwise Herbal, Volume 1 and 2, The Practice of Traditional Western Herbalism, and The Book of Herbal Wisdom. In this podcast, we speak with him about his new book, Holistic Medicine and the Extracellular Matrix. I think this is a very groundbreaking book, and it validates so many modalities of alternative healthcare, holistic healthcare, like cell salts, flower essences, homeopathy, which work on the extracellular matrix, which is a concept that we've only begun to understand scientifically, but which holistic practitioners have known about and intuited forever. So in this episode, we speak with Matthew about what the extracellular matrix is, how it works, how it validates these modalities, and some of the herbs like red clover, mushrooms, marshmallow, opuntia, and other mucilage and polysaccharide containing herbs that work on the matrix. We also speak about Don Ingber's work with tensegrity and how that applies to the matrix. And we do get into some of the problems with modern industrial medicine, which is focused on this idea of the cells as discrete entities instead of parts of the extracellular matrix, which are dependent upon the extracellular matrix for all of their functioning. As usual, if you would like to support the podcast, you can do so at patreon.com slash plant cunning. I hope you enjoy the episode. Okay, so today on the Plant Cutting Podcast, we are honored to have Matthew Wood. And so for those of you who don't know Matthew, which probably there aren't very many of you, he's written some of the, <laughs> like the classic books, the classic contemporary herbal books, like the Earthwise Herbal uh, books, which are, I think, some of the best ways to like really learn herbalism these days. Um, so you've written a new book, though, called The uh, Holistic Medicine and the extracellular matrix yeah yep. that is is just such a great book um and it's a great way to really like visualize and see uh how these holistic medicines herbalism flower essences homeopathy cell salts all these kind of things can actually work scientifically and and it's i think it's really validating for the herbal community and the alternative healthcare community um but to to get started we like to ask our guests how do you come to the plant path? So how, how did you get involved in all these plants? Well, when I was 13, that would have been the summer of 1967, which was that big, well, you weren't there, but that was the big explosion when the hippies, like all of a sudden came out of the woodwork and the whole world changed and, <laughs> and there were LSD was everywhere and stuff, but I was a conservative 13, but, but, uh, sent me a, um, a copy of the teachings of Don Juan by Carlos which came out that summer wow. and that has totally dominated my life that's been my philosophy of life was based on that on one teachings and um mm. so that that first book actually had a little bit more to do with plants than some of the later ones and um from that i learned that plants have uh our focus for consciousness like yeah you got to tune into them they're not on our plane we're we're the species that separate so uh, we, but if you can tune into them, they're a, they're a reference for consciousness. Each one represents some, some kind of specific lesson, spiritual lesson, I would say, on the path of, you know, spiritual evolution, I guess you could call it, in the universe or in the, in the, on the planet, at least. And um, so I had that kind of uh, feeling about the plants and I wasn't that interested in the hallucinogenic plants. I actually was in the medicinal. That's kind of, I don't know. I had never thought about that, but 
but I must have had a calling to be an herbalist. I always I always wondered if I hadn't read that book, would I be an herbalist? But but now that I'm thinking about it, I realize I didn't I didn't have a calling to the uh, psychedelic or hallucinogenic or entheogenic, as they call them today, plants, but um, to, the, to the herbs. And I said each herb was a reference point for consciousness. So, but there were no herb teachers. Uh, but um, you know, in my teens, there, my dad had a couple of herb books, and one of them was on the doctrine of signatures. I recommend them easy to get. That would be um, uh, Ben, Char- ben Charles Harris, um, the let's see, the complete herbal, which is usually available online from a couple bucks to thirty bucks, and um, that's one a really great book on the doctrine of signatures. And I I believed in the doctrine of signatures from a young age there then, and so I started looking at play on things. I remember thinking when I was fifteen, sixteen. Uh, oh, Paracels is my hero because he, I don't know, I'd run into him enough. He talked about plants the way I thought, you know, think from the essence. And then um, I, let's see, I remember though thinking even at that age, 16 or so, uh, plants, the, the most profound way to classify plants is by animal. I mean, that just came out of left field. That's pretty much the Native American way of looking at things. And I, I can't, because we had lived on a couple of reses at different times. Um, um, I spent my uh, first two years on the Seminole Reservation in Florida, where the people had only been in treaty relationship with the white man's government for 18 years in 1954 when we arrived. So, I mean, English was second language that not very many of them spoke. And um, um, so I, I do feel I got a, a different a dose of thinking differently. And I've wondered if that had some influence on the idea the animal was mm. the way to classify the plant, which I mentioned some of my teachings, but I'm only getting a book together on that in the last uh, five years. And I, I'm still writing that. Let's see. So um, then 17, 18, I studied botany. I had a good botany professor. We studied um, field botany, which I really wish was available, um, which is you know teaching what what are the plant communities go out, um, uh, like well actually I remember a native teacher of mine. I was taught see the tree, then the bush, then the little herb underneath, and pretty much actually how I was taught botany. We compared notes. It was like see the tree. That's uh, you know uh, for us out in Minnesota would be. Uh, the prairie or the savanna or the f- hardwood forest or the northern boreal forest or the swamp, you know, you right. guys have less of the prairie and the there's a little bit of savanna, I know, because I've seen Baroque um, woods as far as, Ver- as Vermont, even on yeah. the east side of the chain and in the Hudson Valley. Um, so there are places where semi open still. Um, when the settlers came or, or, or invaders or whatever. And when we came, yeah. <laughs> so since since there, that, my, my ancestors settled in New York. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> I think they, they <laughs> kept some of that area in Prairie with like uh, burnings and uh, they're actually oh. bison in, in like Pennsylvania yeah. and New York. That's crazy. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. My ancestors settled on the Hempstead and Oyster Bay on the Hempstead and they, that was cattle raising country, and um, that was open prairie, and that became cattle raising until the 18, 1900. I don't know, maybe maybe the 1950s. Yeah, yeah. So um, yeah, so some interesting um, environmental. Yeah, so you see the community, and then you know what plants are going to be there. And as you guys know, where do you live in upstate New York? Right in the middle of the state, basically. It's like. Uh, <laughs> North of Binghamton. Yeah, between Utica and, and Oneonta. Oh. Yeah. God, yeah. Oh, that looks so beautiful on the map. I haven't been up there. Yeah, yeah I, I've been along the Delaware on the western end of uh, Ulster County. But um, uh-huh. yeah. yeah, well, that looks like some of the, that's like where the Hall of Fame is and stuff. Cooperstown, yeah. Yeah, yeah right Otherwise, now. Yeah, you see Ben's yeah. at the Cooperstown Market. She does, uh, slings herbs there. <laughs> oh, wow. Cool. Yeah. All right. It's that's such beautiful mountainous territory on the on the map. So, yeah, I can imagine. Yeah. Right. Well, 
Yeah, so let's see. So I st had that uh, botany class and good old Dr. Lawrence and I, I did my, we had to do, so I always say if you learn, so young students here, if you learn 30, 35 plants in your area, you know, with a teacher or something like that, or just going out all the time, you will, and it's a lot easier with a teacher, um, um, you, you'll be able to stumble from point on using field guides and things like that. You'll be able to pretty much figure out what, because in, I mean, unless you live in California where there's 40,000 species compared <laughs> to you know, 4,000 or 10,000 Alabama, Alabama is the next most diverse state after California, it's way lesser. But so you learn, you know, um, those basic plants and you'll do pretty good with the field guides after that. So that's a little hint, uh, but I can, t I'll tell you too, I don't know, you guys, you, you're in a teaching situation. When you have students that have had field botany or like even one class botanist or a naturalist or forest ranger that lasted a couple months, those people know, know how to look at the better than your average even good good quality herbalist even they yeah. just, i can tell them as, as as students they stand out you know mm -hmm. so that's something for people to, to that's just a nice thing you don't have to have it a lot of herbalists are going to be gardener herbalists with a little bit of wafting but uh, it's really nice to know your environment and in yeah. fact you're you're more when I, you wanted me to talk about my mentors and teachers and and really your environment is, you know, your biggest mentor and teacher. And you really should know, you know, nowadays it's customary to, you know, I'm on the land of, well, I'm on the land of the Pomo here. There's still quite a few Pomo up here in Lake County, eight reservations here. But um, uh, the, um, you know, and then, but to me, it's not just the local people that live there, but all kind of environment, you know, well, I'm in yeah. the, the plant and animal community. Valley. Yeah. Yeah. Right. And um, some of that, as you pointed out, due to the burning, the the native people kept the event um, a little bit more prairie, like a little bit more open for good hunting, you know. So, and, you know, now that we appreciate permaculture, just to give, you know, I mean, that was a sophisticated way of survival from the land. Oh, yeah. Um, to have, they had gardens, they had fields, etc. And then they had um, chestnut trees. <laughs> oh, and oaks, yeah, acorns, but chestnuts, you're right, that around here, that this is a ch uh, acorn economy out in California originally. A friend of mine did a study and found out, in fact, it was actually just um, agricultural agents. This agent said, yeah, it takes about uh, one-tenth the energy to live off acorns as it does to live off wheat and and even corn and crops like that wow that's <laughs> so, amazing yeah. <laughs> yeah so um so yeah i'm in the land of the valley oaks here which i really like and back back in minnesota wisconsin i'd be in the land of the bur oaks which i like and mm. uh, uh, that was what my initial paper was on I, I really and that teacher he said oh you really understand the essence of that plant and i was like whoa somebody catches how i'm thinking you know so that was my inspiration. So then uh, I didn't start practice until I was about 20, 28. I got a job in the astrological occult publishing house. So I got to astrology better. Then 29, I got a job just one day a week in the herb store for, for Bob Gallagher, the owner of the store, President Herbs in Minneapolis. Later, as business built, maybe two years later, then I, I worked... Uh, at about 30 hours a week. I could never work full time because I was studying, studying, studying. But I started seeing um, clients and um, like, you know, the, like that would have been the early 1980s. There were so few herbalists and um, there were a few homeopaths. There were a few MD homeopaths, two of them in, in Minneapolis. So um, one of that story is, but, you know, those are different days. Um, you know, I, I, I know how little I knew then, but still you're just helping people and you're building and they are getting, your whole community is getting confidence in the herbs. And so herbs, the Renaissance was kind of the hippie Renaissance and that, that was really my, uh, my uh, Bob, the owner of the store. And, and like, 
your whole community, you know, and then, but I, there were a lot of, what was interesting were the kind of old time long occultists and weirdos and astrologers that, that um, a lot of them looked like they'd fit into normal society, but they sure didn't, but they were like older than kind of the, the hippies and the younger people that were into it, but they were really interesting. And wow, you learned interesting stuff from those people. You know, a lifetime of being in. What's that? Those are my, I wish I could, could have met more of them, you know? Yeah, I know. You know, it's like generations, you don't notice it when you're young and you take that for granted. But I'll tell you a story. So there was one guy, I'll just mention his name. Yeah, Will Warriner. And he came, he was one of the founders of Bloomington, Minnesota, which is the first suburb, suburban ring out in the south side of Minneapolis, 1950. But he started talking. I mean, he just looked like a normal guy. He said, oh, yeah, my my mother was uh, half Ojibwe and my, no, my was a quarter. And my grandmother, grandmother was an Ojibwe, married my grandfather who owned a farm in the upper reaches of the Mississippi near those reses up there. And, and he'd hire her relatives and friends and they'd work in the summertime on the farm there. And there was a young man who got um, this story, his mom told him, who got, uh, um, uh, who, who became unconscious, was just lying there. I don't know the diagnosis, he was just unconscious in his 20s. And they got a medicine woman to come in and it was six hour car before she got there. And he was lying there dead all the time, it seemed to everybody. And meanwhile, they built a sweat lodge and a, and a fire and got a fire and had everything going for her. When she arrived, then she, she, um, they took him in the lodge and um, she, she did ceremonies, but um, Will's um, mother could attend because she was part Ojibwe. And they stuck, um, uh, and the old woman stuck, you know, that gorge from the owls regurgitate, the little teeny stuff of mice yeah. and stuff. And she stuck that down his throat. And after about 20 minutes, he revived. And I was like, oh, my God, it's like, I mean, you could make a medical device out of this. This is like irritate the vagus nerve, the most, the last, the most powerful, like last ditch. You know, evidently he either still was alive or was real close to it. But that nerve is the strongest nerve. And actually, it ramifies everywhere, connected to everything. And I mean, that was like, I mean, can you like, you, you just can't make these lessons up, you know, and, you know, there were other things sometimes as traumatic as that. And, and, um, uh, and that also that teaches us about lobelia, because lobelia would make people vomit, it would revive people from coma, even from um, drowning, they would use it, they would dump it down the throat. Um, of drowned people, and um, you can see how it would wake up that one last powerful nerve. Even if you were technically, let's say, um, it would, you know, at least for a short time, it would get in there. So, um, so wow, okay. So, so the, you know, working in a store like that, and I'm sure, AC, you work in the farmer's market, so people are probably constantly coming up to you and telling you stories and things is that happened to you too oh yeah they're like oh can i show you this scar do you think your calendula sev is going to work on this and they like drop trow <laughs> <laughs> yeah, right yeah but you must also have some owners there that know some stuff i would think up there and it's kind yeah, of apple yeah, totally yeah. there there's more, yeah. and more people that are into it you'll see them looking at all the different tinctures and being like yeah. mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, yeah, and also up there, you're kind of in um, old the Iroquois territory, and there are yeah, native communities scattered all through there, and including um, what would you say, federally recognized unregistered people. There's actually, there's, I mean, actually, a great number of those people that are natives up New Yorkers up there are part Iroquois just to begin with. But um, and actually, that was true even before the revolution. When the Iroquois did the, there was a, I think I remember reading one Swedish uh, Swedish traveler up there uh, for the herbs I was reading him and he said oh yeah there's communities here where of of of, of um speaking Iroquois where ninety percent of the people are white because <laughs> they they'd kidnap kids you know right, so, right yeah and then after the revolution a lot of people just passed for white you know and um. 
So, but anyways, uh, interesting area up there. Definitely not um, where the native people have been completely driven out. Um, and uh, okay, so, um, uh, which is nice. Um, so yeah, my teacher is like, so I worked at this, I, I couldn't understand herbs. So I studied homeopathy because that had the essence more. And it was quite, I learned, yeah, my early learning was from the Doctrine of Signatures and Dr. Bach and the few homeopathic, and I studied all the herbs that were common to herbalism and homeopathy, like St. John's Wort, Boneset, Calendula, um, you know, in those days, Calendula really was a little bit more of a homeopathic remedy than an herb. Um, let's see. Uh, well, elder is actually in that bunch, um, but other things that are really easy to use, um, like Ignatia and stuff that are not native to art. But so I studied that and I studied the Bach flower remedies because Agamoni, Vervain, Oak, that was like the essence shining through in his indicates. And something like Agamoni, you see, oh, it's so tortured looking, you know, out in the field or in the garden. It just has spikes like, <sighs> And um, I've actually just, I don't know, well, try this on for size for all these running around, all these vaccine, non-vaccinated. Um, I actually thought of um, Agar Yarrow together. A friend of mine, is she, she hasn't reported back. She's not vaccinated, but she feels like she gets shedding. She works in a school, still tolerate her not being vaccinated. But um, um, that just struck me as a, combination that might be good for protection against the spike proteins and things. Hmm, agrimony. Uh, but agrimony. yeah, yeah. Also, I'd say, yeah, holy, I had dreams last night. This Omicron is has spikes on spikes on spikes. And I had a dream about a buck, um, a deer spikes, you know, and actually I think um, I, I kind of hope this, this, this variant is so, a contagious but mild. I kind of hope that may finish off the the um, the epidemic um, when everybody gets infected with a mild, who's left over with a mild infection. But at any rate, so those are a few ideas. I actually have helped people with without um, kind of tuning into that final kind of spike. I, you know, you just help people with COVID if they're too hot or too cold. They, too cold. If uh, oftentimes the lungs need to be warmed up and mucus be gotten out of there, which is not that hard to do with lungs. And even I had one woman upstate New York, um, actually, who had uh, her um, oxygen, her hy hypoxia. She was down to seventy-five, and she had got a. I did tell her to get an, a uh, uh, oxygen machine because she tended to be low, anyways. Odiola got her up to like 93 in in like one day. <laughs> so, wow. and yeah, that was not my inventions. That's one that Lisa Ganora and several of the other herbalists um, came up with. And so, yeah. So, um, and what's the signature that grows in mountains in Siberia? So it's very good for, you know, altitudinous and maybe... It's not really, a, it's kind of a cooling remedy, not a warming remedy. But, um, okay, so, yeah, uh, yeah. Well, questions? Well, so, you seem to be a very, like, you know, an intuitive practitioner. Yeah. yeah. That, that really shines through, but, like, also taking the time to do all the studying and the intellectual studying to, like, yeah. make it make sense. <laughs> yeah. The intellect, I think, is, is really important. But, so, in... In, in doing that, do you think we could shift to the extracellular matrix and sort of we uh, AC and I can try to summarize what what we're what we think of after reading your book, and then you can kind of correct yeah. us. Yep, you bet. So I am seeing the extracellular matrix as a fluid, sort of like a live fluid, like seawater that surrounds all of the cells in our body and actually is responsible for controlling whether they eat, sleep, eliminate, et cetera. Yeah. Uh, actually, I'd, you'd see me nodding if, uh, if we were uh, at video. Um, 
Yeah, actually, so that's exactly how I started. I would add one more thing that it's it's more like glop than seawater. It's seawater that's become glop. Um, yeah, like the easy and, water. The... Yeah, it's gloppier even than that. Hmm. But yeah, you got it right. Easy water from Dr. Her- uh, from Gerald Pollack um, and look that up. And um, that's liquid crystalline gel is like what the water in the maze is. But with all these polymers running through it, then it becomes really, Wikipedia called it glop like, like uh, 10 years ago. And I, I was like, oh, yeah, that's exactly because see when yeah. we mix up some, some uh, marshmallow root or um, slippery elm or eat some, uh, some okra as a vegetable with, with a lot of that, poly, uh, a lot of the polysaccharides, polysaccharides are the pulp that are in the matrix. So, so we're eating the matrix of a plant uh, of the marshmallow or the slippery elm when we're um, having that glop. Mm-hmm. So the glop is well mucilage or demulcents. And basically, once I read this, I realized, wait a second, wow. So the only people in the whole world who deal with matrix stuff all the time are herbalists and scientific researchers on the matrix. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> we'll we'll nod to the occasional uh chef that uses um um you know cooks okra. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Right. Well, so one right. of the important things though is is that it kind of upends the scientific medical way of looking at cells, right? Like they, we used to think of yeah. cells as like individual discrete self-regulating entities, yeah. but they're actually regulated by the matrix. They're regulated a hundred percent. So the brain of the cells, we think the brain of the cell inside the cell, whereas really it's outside, it's in the in the main in the polymers. And um, that is what's telling the cell what to do. So yes, you're quite right. We we just automatic that way. That goes back to the cell theory, 1858. It's it's really unbelievable that up till then people had a humoral reference system. Oh, it's all the fluids in our body that you know we you know. So like in you know France or Europe where he was, it would have been like yeah we you know we do cupping some some humors we we vomit or have diarrhea or you know laxative you know, primitive, you know, that's kind of real simple medicine, but um, that's how everybody thought. And then, you know, really the whole idea of cell as a, as a, you know, kind of captain of its, of its own ship is really a projection from humans. We're like that, or we think we are, we live in a bigger matrix we don't we're not aware of. Yeah. Maybe they aren't either. Maybe they think they have free will. Ha, ha, that'd be great. <laughs> but yeah, it's like, come on, sell, pull yourself up by your bootstraps, you know? <laughs> yeah, right, right. Yeah, you can do it. <laughs> and uh, yeah, yeah, but it's there's I'm not getting good signals here. <laughs> so um, yeah, so way back, Burkow 1857 or whatever, he uh, there was a doctor that disagreed, one of the prominent ones, Dr. Uh, let's see, Carl von Rokotansky, and he was head of the medical school in Vienna, a real, real, real prominent um, medical school. And they ever since then, they disagreed. They did not agree with the cell theory, but more that the capillary was a supreme arbiter of health, like the blood, too much blood to an area, not enough blood, um, medium amount, whatever. Um, and that actually has some influence in German medicine to this day. But but they opposed it generation to generation until we get to Pissinger and Alfred Pissinger, one of my heroes. And in, eight, in 1975, he wrote uh, this um, you know, theory, um, how the extracellular matrix justifies um, holistic medicine. So he understood it. And, and they had been realistic practitioners for a hundred and some years. They stuck with this and wouldn't give up. So I think that's a greater sin. Like, it's like, oh, Galileo opposed the church and, you know, till finally his view won, you know, well, yeah, that's nothing compared to three generations of opposition to the scientific medical universe. And it's still going on. They hardly anybody. I mean, I mean, uh, I mean, I thought until 10 years ago, oh, the, the cell is the center of the universe for the body, too. And and I find this on websites and everything because it's as one of the researchers said. It's very hard to visualize the matrix, and that's and that's true. And it's 
it's that and linear thinking that we've been trained to and and what are our prejudice is the, the idea that it is that traps us in the old view. Yeah. yeah. Well, I think it's a lot easier to visualize it if you view it intuitively and holistically, you know? And the yeah. training like takes, it makes, you know, it views everything as discrete separate entities, you know, like separating and separating everything down and down to the atom. Yeah. Or looking at things as holes, like an ecosystem. Yeah, so we have reductionism and holism and, you know, every scientific book, you know, for eighth would use those two terms and reductionism is getting it down to the molecule, the atom and holism is seeing the whole organism as a whole. And, you know, some sciences you do really more and more in um, environmental sciences and, you know, biological sciences in the outer world and all that. They do have to, you know, pay attention to that a little bit more. But that's not real science. No. Real science for the real scientists is the molecule, you know, but they're diluted. And right. yeah, the matrix pretty much as, as AC described it there, the it is the seawater with the slime in it. And 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 so it's thicker and it thickened, it's more of a thick thing. And and as as you Isaac mentioned too, the um, the easy water. And so is uh, there's electrical there's electrical charges held on the polymers, uh -huh. and, which are not just they're more like feathers that fold out and on and fold in. More water they fold out, they plump out. Less water they they draw together, and that would be when we'd see wrinkles if we were if it was near the surface. So your matrix is wrinkling up, but but um, they held, hold electrical charges. And we're going to get to this exciting material I didn't know about when I wrote the book. Unfortunately, it's what happens. Different scientists, different the world. They're not aware of each other. Yeah. I wasn't aware of them. And this um, from um, Buckminster Fuller explains the signals change the tensions on the on the um, uh, the polymers and that actually and the shapes of the molecules and the receptors and everything. Yeah, so it actually makes sense. So dynamic, yeah. Yeah, that, the, Dr. Ingber's work that you, you sent us a video of him, and he seems to me to, to be another, like, he's a hardcore scientist, like, top echelon, you know, has, yeah. like, $300 million of funding or whatever. Works for but, the military. Sometimes. But he's, yeah. he's an intuitive thinker. Like, he immediately yeah. saw, after taking an art class, how cells were structured like tensegrities, like Buckman, Buckminster Fuller. And actually, I mean, the, the whole human body is a tensegrity. You know, I didn't even realize. Yeah. yeah. No, I didn't either. And, you know, so I just had this from from uh, Pissinger and then his student, Heine, who I think is still alive, died in 1986. But, but uh, so um, the, yeah, I just thought, oh, oh the whole, so the electrical potential is just a resting um, charge on, you know, sort of a bunch of fibers, so to speak. And then all of a sudden, a current comes in there, like you eat more salt, less salt, more sunshine, less sunshine, whatever. You're smiling, you're crying, all that. All of a sudden, a single gets signal gets to the to the matrix um, and fans out everywhere simultaneously. That's why it's holistic on the cell vegetative level. We are one. All the cells react, get the signal, and react at the same time. And if they don't get the signal, they're not turning into cancer. They're just plain dying. Because even cancer cells are addicted to these signals. They have to use the signals too, which was a tremendous insight here. Well, these signals come out through these changes in shape, tensegrity of tension. And tensegrity, I, I don't understand it totally, but it kind of defies gravity to some extent because it's like building, you know, well, like uh, it, the way uh, kind of defies gravity it holds itself up without having more walls or real and um so uh yeah so this was a picture that like wow now i understand why the cells react and why that little teeny electric ch charge potential electric potential change can just dominate it's like having a thunderstorm um in the sea i think i i yeah i um Quoted, yeah, the ancient Greek philosopher who said, uh, one half the sea, one half the flash of lightning. That is really what it's like in there. Uh -huh. It's like this sea and then the flash of lightning. And 
you know, if there was a flash of lightning on the, oh, he, that Dr. Ingbar, like he, he shows how this, he found when he was, a, you know, in college, you know, when he was taking the art class and then he began to look at this and then he noticed if there was an electrical charge that went into the Petri dish, the cells would jump. So you imagine the electric strike in the ocean and all the cells jump in a way, you know, that are right at the surface near the strike. And so, um, so they're getting trained from the beginning, beginning to, and, and Kissinger addressed, and so I thought this before I got to page three of his book, um, I thought, well, yeah, but how about the cells in the ocean they have a regulatory system? They don't have a matrix. And he says, seawater is the regulatory system of the single cell in the ocean. Right. And like, yeah. And that was not only the answer to that little question, but that's like we humans, each one of us are, you know, part of the inner environment. We don't think of it that way, but we are constantly receiving signals and we're constantly yeah. interacting. Yeah. I was just anyway. going to ask you actually a question about this. So if the extracellular matrix rec- matrix regulates us and all of our cells, what regulates the matrix? Like who watches the watcher, you know? Oh, oh yeah. Well, I'm not sure I thought of that. See, there's probably a hundred things that people have brought up that I did not think of. And I'm glad because yeah. I wanted this book to be, first, I wanted it to justify us holistic practitioners and herbalists. And it does. And we should hold our head high and say, science is on our side. And, and little by little, as we assume that mantle of authority, so to speak, the guys are going to notice it. And maybe they'll talk to us sometimes. And <laughs> once in a while. Yeah, right. You laugh. Yeah, that's like me. I'm like, yeah, yeah. you know, as an old there's a certain number of herbalists that like can deal with the muggle community and stuff. And then the rest of us are like Harry Potter's world. You're just like in another dimension, you know? Yeah. (laughs) Yeah. Rubbing shoulders sometimes. Right. But um, uh, yeah, let's see. I forgot what your question was. I zoomed off there. Um, Yeah. So what regulates the matrix? uh, Yeah. Okay. Well, um, I mean, I I would have to say it's the Grand Puba. I I can't think of anything that stands above it per se, um, other than you know, sunlight, electricity, water, you know, earth, or molecules themselves, um, and oxygen. Those things are what change it all the time. I put a chapter in on that, and. Yeah, I guess you could say, ah, all right. It's kind of interesting. I would say the sun probably regulates it more than anything else because of the the easy water. So that's interesting. Ah. But that's great. That's amazing. But the water is conditioned constantly. So what Dr. Uh, what Gerald Pollack showed was that um, the uh, the, when the water is on a hydrophilic surface, I accidentally said lipophilic surface when I was teaching the, the International Herb Symposium. So stand corrected. Um, and um, so hydrophilic, that's a water loving surface. So when sunlight down on water running across a, or sitting on a hydrophilic surface, so imagine the going in and coming out and on the sand and on the rocks. And, or a stream running down a rocky, you know, slope, um, stream bed. So you have um, uh, um, the sunlight beating on the stone, on the water, and the water has changed from H2O to H3O plus slash H2O2 minus. Slash means these two water molecules become ions with a sludge. They pick, one picks up uh, uh, extra hydrogen, the other one picks up an extra oxygen, and they, and they, um, and so they must have a negative charge and they're loosely bound to each other. So, and that's, and that's heavier, that's this liquid crystalline water <clears throat> of the matrix. Well, so this is the milieu within which all this has to occur. In fact, the old term for the internal, the matrix is used as a milieu interior for French. And so this is the milieu, the environment within which everything, all this changes. And it's not possible to be maintained without the sunlight. 
We could say, yeah, the water is essential. Talk is essential. So like, how is this happening in us? Like really, like if you stick your hand up to the sun, you know, you can see the light goes through it and the light is going through us all the time and in our extremities or the top, you know, couple centimeters or excuse me, millimeters of our, of our fingers. And we're getting constantly getting that lipophilic, that hyalic surface with the uh, um, water being renewed. So our, so H2O for us is a waste product of cellular aeration. And we either ha- expire it in the air perhaps, or I'm not really sure. I don't think this has been researched out. What is the, what's the water that go, comes out in the mist on our breath? I would presume it's more H2O and less of the good water, but but mm. the good water is always being re- or the H2O being renewed in the extremities by the sunlight, etc. So, um, so it's kind of like the god of our world is is the sun, and the god of that world is the sun. I'd say. <laughs> yeah, that's interesting. <laughs> that makes a lot of sense. And so the other yeah. thing about the sun, though, too, is like it's constantly emitting electromagnetic frequencies. And that's uh, yes. a really big part of the matrix too. Like you talk about uh, Fistenberg, right? Our Arthur. first book. Yeah. And so yeah. What, what did, what did his understanding of electromagnetic frequencies um, in, how did that inform this book? Yeah. Well, I sure caught myself lucky as having run across him. I was down in Santa Fe, my friends down there were from him and we went to visit. And I mean, he's a guy that dedicated because he ended up finding that he had EMF induced illness. He studied it and then he settled in a place where there was a huge amount of, I can't remember, iron ore or copper or silver or something up there under, way under, under that part of the world so that it's well grounded. And um, it's kind of peculiar because I had dreams about this later on. But uh, so I was a true believer just talking to him and getting his book, which is called, um, let's see. The History of Humanity and Electricity, the Invisible, the Invisible Rainbow. And it's self-published, should be on Amazon, and it's probably about 35 bucks last time I I, I got a copy directly from him. That was nice. But um, so uh, it's, it's like one-third citations, and like it's so heavily documented um, that EMFs affect us. And this is just, it's just undeniable. And if he doesn't need to redefine the symptoms of, of um, we could say EMF poisoning, because he, he just defines the first paper, he quotes the first paper written in 1775 when they were playing around with Leiden jars and people were getting shocks and they used it as a form of therapy. And about a third of the people got better, a third of the people, nothing happened. And a third of the people got worse, you couldn't tell who, but... But those people, they wrote down the symptoms, and the symptoms are the same as now. I, I don't suffer this too much, although I notice in different situations. I notice when I'm in a log cabin or in a forest you are, or in a sauna, you're cut off from the EMFs. That really protects you really well. And um, that wood drowns it. And um, so I can notice it when it's not there, but it doesn't, it doesn't affect health. But I just feel this constant kind of scratching on my aura or something like he, 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 he. Um, and that's human thoughts and human uh, human made EMFs and you know the, the EMFs of the of the solar system really the astrology of the moment and uh, and the sun yeah so so that book that was a great insight and then one more thing from there was the importance of the porphyrins which are like kind of like little Celtic crosses equal sided cross molecule and they thing to do with oxygen and life they are there helping the oxygen into the lungs the hemoglobin is a porphyrin the chlorophyll is a porphyrin and um, other like uh, the famous c450 and the st john's word axon in the liver that's a porphyrin because because um you need in order to oxidize those fats and oils that the liver gets some um, you need that oxygen and and that's and that's part of that phase one pathway in the liver so um so porphyrins are incredible and say port you know we have the active ingredients active ingredients active ingredients and and i tend to simplify them all down to 
half a dozen or eight or nine and, and like you know tannin mucilage um you know and then um essential volatile oils and then you know um, uh, monoterpenes and terpenes and terpenoids and or families polyphenols and and so on but um this was a new thing. John's wort has protoporins, and therefore it helps these um, enzyme pathways. And as far as I know, no other herb that we use or know of acts on the um, porphyrins other than St. John's wort. And I think, did I, I think I put that in the book. I think there's, so this really helps us to understand what St. John's wort does. And yeah, I am an intuitive. And if I can't feel something fitting together, locking together into that ism from the reductionism, if I can't feel the parts, and I could never feel a St. John's wort. It's like, what is this doing? I just kind of use it on keynotes, you know, injuries to areas rich in nerves, the homeopathic or serious pain or sciatic pain or or bleeding, although I, you know yarrow would be better. Bleeding with pain, um, and a little bit, yeah, strength in the liver. I had not gotten into that that much until recently, um, although there was good read for that. From uh, I know people thirty years ago before anybody knew about the the um, CYP CP four fifty that we're using it as a liver remedy because that's the way they used it in Eastern Europe, I should say friend there was do, doing that he was trained by a russian trained uh, herbalist doctor um yeah so well so at any rate geez i'm wandering here um, i mean that makes a lot of sense like because for me it was mind-blowing to see about poor friends like that the blood in, a, in an animal the red blood is in is the same kind of substance as the gl- green chlorophyll in a plant and then with the saint john's wort i mean it bleeds red you know it's like, yeah. it's like, that's, that's really interesting to me as far as like, like, you know, signs, like looking at a, at a plant symbolically. Yeah. You know, and this reminds me one time when we're young and herbalists, I was talking to one of my friends now, what major well-known herbalist you, but you always make mistakes, but she, um, she tinctured um, St. John's wort, not only the flowers, but the leaves, the upper parts of the plant. And she tinctured them in alcohol, maybe even in the sun, the way, you know, we're supposed to do that in the sun. Jeez, that's really interesting. I never, I never even made that connection. There's so many connections to be made. This, this new work. And, and, and I leave it, it's like scattered. The whole thing scatters gems on the ground and, and they're there for everybody to pick up. Because people constantly say things to me and I'm like, well, I never thought of that, you know. And, and that happened on the question and answer thing for the the International Herb Symposium really recommend that people get that if they want to know more about that. That was like 100, well, 800, 300 asking questions, like, well, 60 of them maybe asked questions, but like, and and there were just tons of things I hadn't thought of. And it's like, please, you guys got to do the next research. I, you know, it's like, <laughs> so, but at any rate, yeah, what, what, what was I saying? Um, uh, maybe about St. John's Wort. Yeah. So, um, yeah. yeah, I never thought of it. Important. Yeah. Sit in the sun. Okay. So she had it sit in the sun, leaves and flowers. And what she, two fractions, one was blue and one was red. <laughs> uh, I've never run across anybody else forgetting that, but uh, that was pretty peculiar. Um, it had kind of a chlorophyll extract and a, uh, I can't call it a hemoglobin extract, but a blood like <laughs> extract. Yeah. Yeah. That's really interesting. What, one of the things that you, that you talked about in that talk, the IHS talk um, was like mushrooms and fungi. Cause like in the book, you talk a lot about polysaccharides and how like those are so important and you were thinking of them in terms of like mucilage, but mushrooms yeah. have so many po- polysaccharides. And I mean, we, that's something that we've been really into this year, especially like making mushroom powders. Mm-hmm. I mean, yeah. we've taking mushroom tinctures for a long time, but yeah. getting all the different, you know, inputs. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah. No, uh, to my great embarrassment, I did not even think of that while writing the book. Um, that kind of came to me afterwards. Like, well, someone said um, one of the very first readers, not even an herbalist, well, she was a pharmacist, I guess that counts. She said, oh, well, this like the mycelium in the ground connecting the whole um, vegetable, you know, whole life community out yeah, there. Like network, yeah. 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 And I was like, oh my God, I never even thought of that. Like, 
I mean, you just, you just can't think of everything. So that's so true. And that really made me think like, wow, walking barefoot is even more cool than, than one would think. And something I'm going to start doing, and I have started doing since then, partly because, yeah, Dr. Christopher said, yeah, if you're having insomnia and constipation, which I never get, I never get constipated my whole life, but but in the last couple of months, I was getting constipation with terrible insomnia. And he said, yeah, all the, the cosmic energy comes in your brain and you, you don't ground it. You don't, you're walking on you know, synthetic and carpets and things. And it's like, you got to get out there on the lawn and walk on your, walk on, barefoot. And, uh, and then you'll discharge that energy into the earth. And sure enough, I started sleeping better and my constipation went away. So it's like, whoa, so... So, but I would say it's like a greater communication system that we are part of. And um, I mean, really, he kind of says it. Well, he's, you know, the, the whole idea, you know, your inspirations, your like soul star comes down on top of your head. The Hopi, Hopi says, uh, keep the top of your head open to creator. And so the energy comes down, your inspirations. And then, yeah, it's great to get inspired, but then you have to ground them. Send mm-hmm. them through your body, down through the into the earth, and that's analogous with getting things done. I think yeah. that's, a, that's a physical, a thick, energetic, spiritual activity analogous to getting your work done, helping people. You guys are following, following, and and I am too. So so that made it. It was like holy cow, this is like really real. Like I thought of that. It's not in the book. <laughs> And then, and then I thought, then I clapped my hand against my head pretty literally, or at least at like a, a cartoon vision of myself. And then I, I was like, oh my God, like I've totally left out mushrooms. Like mushrooms act on the intelligence in the matrix. And, and the, okay, so, right. You guys know more about mushrooms than me. And actually, well, I, you know, you live in a great place for mushrooms. I mean, Adirondacks, Catskills, there's just going to be miles of, Oh yeah. Wilderness. <laughs> yeah. Oh yeah. They say <laughs> <laughs> so many. Well, we, we've got dozens of different species of mushrooms this year and, you know, have like, you know, yeah. like 12 mushrooms in our powder <laughs> that we oh, all wow. grow, you know, from like 10 miles wow. radius. She wow. in a 10 mile radius. Oh, my God. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, so as you know, so mushrooms, they're quote ingredient, but just their major one active ingredient. This is again where there's an unusual single active ingredient. So that is um, the beta glucons. All mushrooms, it almost defines what is a mushroom and has beta glucons. And even the little table, the little, you know, button mushroom that has beta, that has lots of beta glucons. That's that can be very medicinal. Um, the portobellos have, have all the mushrooms, the uh, the wooden shelf fungi. They all have beta glucons. They don't all get released really easily, especially the woody woody ones. But so those rub against the the lining. Uh, you guys know those talking about it for your listeners, and they, they rub against the the cell wall there, and um, that rubbing um, they confer signals over the cell wall into the matrix, and. Actually, so we're also interacting here, I think the microbiome, the microbiome is like a little thin matrix of the, of the bacteria, friendly and unfriendly on the insides of the intestines, plus everywhere, even in the blood. I don't, I couldn't get from the paper whether it was on the inside, probably on the inside of the, the vessels, there's a, there's microbiome in there and there's microbiomes all over the place in your, in your system, like persistent earache, that's because there's a microbiome in the middle ear and the flora gets the fauna rather tough and then you got mists and stuff. Well, so the beta glucons are rubbing against the, the mix and the microbiome and sending signals and signals are going back. And then in addition, they have other signal, each of them has other signals too. And that we just don't know, we haven't gotten to the point where we can read mushrooms and their essence is the way we can read um, plants, I think. we At least I can't. There's not as good. I, I would say there's a, there's a mushroom essence by Robert Rogers. He's probably the person who's farthest ahead in thinking in terms of patterns of, um, of uh, 
uh, in the mushrooms. And yeah, and there's another called Radical Mycology, self-published um, from like Oregon or so. And he at least gives astrological attributions to different groups of fungi. And that's a start. I mean, that's what I started with. There was not much language of architecture for herbalism when I, Chinese medicine didn't exist in the 70s and 80s or in any great extent. Well, well I, it did, the five elements did exist, but you know, you had, you kind of had to have a teacher to figure out how to apply that and not to herbalism. It wasn't applied that way. Hmm. Um, yeah. So, so they have, so there, that's a huge field, I think, you know, well, I, I'm a little bit, yeah, I suppose the misfortune of the hemlock trees for your area is a, is a, to, you must get a lot of, um, Reishi. of, yeah. um, oh God, yeah. So how are the, um, how are the hemlocks doing up there? They're doing fine right here. Uh, as of now, it's more of a Southern Appalachian thing. Um, I haven't seen any woolly dalgids around here. I mean, but at the same, in the same, oh, uh, on this other hand, like the, the ash borer only just arrived to our location. So we still have like giant living ash trees yeah. which are just starting to die. So we're just a little bit, you know, later in the cycle. Yeah. That started in Michigan. I got to West Minnesota where I hang. Oh, 10 years ago or eight at mm-hmm. least. Um, yeah. Okay. Well, I'm relieved about that with the hemlocks and I'm hoping that the, the black, ash down in the swamps in the far north that's like zone two like the coldest places in northern minnesota for in the canadian shield up into you know i don't know how far they go but i can't imagine uh emerald i don't know that's pretty hard to survive we'll see i hope that some ashes survive and slowly regenerate but it's very good to know about the hemlock and um I, I was once reading, I, I couldn't see the source here, but it was just a history of the Catskills um, <clears throat> based on pollen records and stuff. And there was a huge dive in hemlock pollen about 5,000 years ago, and then it came back in. So there was some kind of blight that hit it then, and it re, and then it came back. So my hope is that, the, that it, well, it looks for certain that in the, Zone three and four in the north that the the hemlocks will dive, and yeah. they like cold places. It is, yeah. So the and then they'll begin to develop some sort of on the frontier, like I don't know Pennsylvania. I've seen them in North Carolina just drag on for in the mountains, drag on for years. They're not quite dying, but not thriving. So then on this, they'll begin to develop some immunity and they'll come back you know and i think there is some i think there's some like other you know animal like insect or something that eats the adalgid so oh. i think there's like uh, introducing that i'm not sure on on like the exact spe- uh, specifics of it but i mean hemlocks like hemlock forests are just so amazing they're like one of the most beautiful serene areas you can walk through like in the, in the, so the soft needles the open open oh. forest it's just amazing wow no, I really, uh, yeah. I hope they figure it out. <laughs> yeah, I, I have. Uh, so Minnesota, Wisconsin, on the border there, where I live near the Twin Cities. Um, yeah, they don't have hemlock there, but I bought. Oh, well, yeah, I was talking about the EMFs, and uh, yeah, when I had COVID last year, um, I had it from March to June, and um, and uh, I had really intense dreams, which lots of people have, and I had these constant dreams, like to land in upper Michigan. And, and um, uh, in fact, they were like dragons telling me to get the there. And the dragons showed me they like to be there because it grounded them against EMFs, both the astronomical wow. and the human and because of all the cop there. And it was like, like so I got I got a, a piece of land on that spine of the dragon, I call it on the copper range there. That's like little mountain range that goes for hundreds of miles. And, it's about one mile wide and 300 miles long. Whoa. Yeah, about 15,000 feet, 500 feet. But uh, yeah, so, but um, there's some, there's some hemlock there. So they are just, they're very pleasing to look at, but we don't have whole groves of them really. 
So, okay. yeah, we're blessed with that up here in like the, the, these Northern Appalachians, there's some really beautiful hemlock groves. Yeah. Um, but to, to get back to the ECM, um, yeah. so it makes the understanding the ECM makes sense of how things like flower essences and cell salts and herbalism can work on yeah. the body because it works through the matrix, right? Yeah. And it works yeah. Like no. Pills. Yeah. Pissinger visually um, the polymers, the ground. So he called that that electric charge the ground regulatory system. But yeah, like oh, okay. So what commands the ground regulatory system? Sunlight. Another one would be seawater. Yes. Okay. Actually, to answer AC's question from seawater would be uh you know the lord of the lord <laughs> of the manor yeah the overseer the, uh the king in charge of the the duke but uh yeah because seawater um all the electrolytes so so the electrolytes are a very important figure and i i have done some writing on this and i do hope to get that book out but but that involves a lot of stuff i find that um, you know, because there's acid alkaline. Oh, that's another issue. We'll get to acid alkaline. Yeah. But um, yeah, the, so yeah, the electrolytes are very important, and that's the cell salts. And the cell salts take on a whole nother significance. Once the more you begin to visualize this, I think this will really help the whole salt world to um, kind of gel as well. And and uh, I I gotta get that book out here at some point in time here. Um, yeah. So, Wait. and then, yeah, homeopathy is still not justified by anything materialistic. <laughs> as what it's, you know, medicine. But, but, I, you know, now we know one thing we do know from the matrix, I mean, just tiny amounts, one in a million of something can influence the signals in the matrix, there can be a response, especially if it's something you have a sensitivity to, like, you are, uh, um, you know, uh, pulsatella type or black coash type, uh, semisifuga or something. If you really need that, you are hypersensitive to that, the molecules or the energetic, you know. And yeah, I would say the whole water hole thing, which kind of get into that in the book, but that that's uh, from France. I've, that's justified homeopathy. Therefore, the scientists hate it, try to suppress it. And um right. But a lot of why why so much resistance from the science community to this idea of holism? Like, was there ever a time where science wasn't in bed with corporations and you know, money? Yeah, yeah. Like, how did we go wrong as like a science community? How do we miss this like huge thing? Well, the yeah, I would say. So doctors were in command, you know, well, they weren't that prestigious, you know, 1890, 1900, you decide what you want to do for a profession. Being a doctor was not that big a deal. It was like a little bit more than, you know, being a farmer or something or a grocer or something, but it was not really that prestigious. In fact, probably being a minister was probably the most prestigious in those days. But doctors, so then they began to limit medical schools, you know, we're going to herbalists, the homeopaths, we're going to be real exclusive, we're going to define our, our, our profession, we're going to be hoity-toity. That happens in the really in the 40s, 50s, 60s, when they, they closed the last homeopathic school in 1947, it was, yeah, our department. And, um, and, and, you know, in 1930, there was like 20 departments of homeopathy and, and several herbal school, the schools left, or at least the Eclectic Institute. And um, they got rid of all that from hoity-toity and we're, you know, so then in the, in the forties, they wanted, it was thirties or forties. Um, they wanted to do socialized medicine. Uh, I, I would have to say like, um, yeah, my, my family, and I was mentioning, yeah, my grandfather, he was a socialist and he said, uh, FDR stole the socialist platform. Or <laughs> you could say he, he incorporated it into America. That's where the, you know, people that critics would call it the welfare state but so they wanted to get socialized and quote unquote but uh, um that couldn't pass the doctors really but they weren't as strong in other foreign countries so most countries have a better public health system than we have so the doctors were strong but little by little the the um 
pharmaceutical, big pharma, pharmaceuticals, um, big pharma snuck up and really has taken over. And they, I mean, they own the hospitals, the insurance companies, hospitals, and and um, drug companies. They're all, you know, together and you know, each other and common shareholders and trustee boards and whatnot. And then the doctors are just employees and they very definitely have suffered a loss of both power and of even financially compared to big corporations. And so, you know, doctors still make a great living, but um, not as much as they once did, I would say, comparatively. I yeah, mean, a doctor would compare. They have yeah. to go half a million dollars in debt to, to do it anyway. Yeah, yeah. And whereas to invest in a, I, you, you do better investing in pharmacy, but pharmaceutical companies. So then in the early 1986, they took away the liability. So people were suing um, Big Pharma for all the vaccines that were backfiring and causing obvious damage. And so they came to before the Senate and they said, <clears throat> and the House of Representatives, U.S., and said, well, we really make more of these because we're getting so much. This is a great, you know, public tool, health tool, and we consider, uh, you know, making us, taking away our liability. And, um, oh, okay, yeah, we'll do that. And we'll set up a court that hates oh. um, <laughs> cases. Yeah. And, you know, like two years ago when I last looked, it was six and a half billion dollars had been given to people whose kids had been maimed or they themselves have been maimed or killed by vaccines. And, and um, so then all these people run around, there's no side effects of vaccines. Well, there are courts set up to, to pay off people that have had vac damage. So, so, but the, the, um, I mean, so that's, what can you say? That's fake news. There are, there is from vaccines that yeah. that's been suppressed. And, you know, like Robert F. Kennedy, like, uh, you know, he did, uh, you know, he's really studied this and there was like a ban. He could not speak at any medical school or any conference anywhere in the country, period. You know, it's because he's the enemy because he's investigated all this. Well, so that was bad enough. And that leads to the current situation where they just want to vaccinate everybody and ignore the science. Like, just, I don't want to get, I haven't been vaccinated. I don't know about you guys, but, but at any rate, like uh, natural no, we- immunity... You, what's that? Uh, no, we yeah. haven't been vaccinated either. Yeah. 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 Hey, Rob. But uh, at any rate, but it's everybody can decide what they want. But, but yeah, exactly. The, yeah. The, the papers are out absolutely over 40 papers showing natural immunity is long and is way better than the vaccine. In fact, the vaccines that people are just getting, everybody who's been vaccinated is getting getting the disease now because it, it doesn't protect you from getting infected it does appear to protect people from more serious illness but yeah. also it has side effects mm-hmm. and they are really hiding all this because they've been doing it for years with with vaccines and and so so there's that problem plus then in the early 2000s i remember this it was it was the bush administration but I, but it was the Democrats and the Republicans jumped on the, on the bandwagon, and they just they wrote the drug in like drugs would be used by, you know, Medicare and Meta. They, I mean, they just indulged the, the lobby of the big pharma totally, so that they they make massive massive amounts of money, and then but it costs massive amounts of money to get through the FDA regulatory system, eight hundred million dollars per, per drug. And then you know eight hundred dollars to market it, and um, and and then they make billion dollars though. And um, if it's a good drug, sometimes they have some problems. And um, so that was the early two thousand. So now they they they've really taken over. They've taken over the CDC, the FBI, the FBI, no, the FDA, and <laughs> um, and really the Maybe that media. And the media too. I don't want to get you know into conspiracy, blah blah blah. Well, oh, all of us that don't get vaccinated are all typecast Trumpite, um, QAnon, um, anti-Semite Nazis. I mean, me and my friends have been called that. Like we're old liberals. We were until they like kicked us out of the the right. nest. Um, uh, <laughs> and and most of the good news on this is is right wing people or 
Well, I, I'd say, I, like, I watched Del Big Tree, and he's really a he's a political now. He just doesn't even go there because both parties are so totally <laughs> ensnared in it. Yeah. <laughs> but of information being suppressed is believable, and and I mean. Uh, Tony Fauci says, I am, if you attack me, you attack science. It's like, whoa, that's like saying I'm God, you know? And in fact, I am uh, the, the, the legal representative of God on earth. <laughs> yes, <laughs> right. Because science is God. I mean, the, the religion of pride. Yeah. Like, it's yep, <laughs> it is. Yeah. Yeah. And actually, I did, I'm not behind the curve, but when, I mean, when I wrote my book, when it was published, uh, well, when I turned it in, I did go over how in New England Journal of Medicine and The Lancet, some of those unbelievable, I got to read that one quote if I can find it from The Lancet. And um, and then from John Ionides, just, just showing that that 70% of, of um, all medical tests could not possibly prove anything because they weren't mathematically rigorous. Well, well, holy cow. I mean, this that's really actually that caused a, a revolution of hand wringing. They really haven't cured that problem. Yeah, the and, replication crisis. I mean, like, what do you do when like most of the 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 actual science can't be replicated? That's that's <laughs> crazy. <laughs> I know. Yeah, and so that seventy percent in nineteen in two thousand three was already mathematically impossible. Then. The same year, Marsha Angel, the editor of the New England Journal, came out and she said, Big Pharma can just dictate what they want. The tests are worthless. And then the editor of the um, Lancet, which is really an important, you know, worldwide journal, Richard Horton, he's still the editor. This is 2015. And he comes back from uh, meeting a national conference held in the UK in 2015. He writes a uh, editorial and this is, this is a, a lot of what is published is incorrect quote unquote i'm not allowed to say who made this remark because we were asked to observe chatham house rule evidently that's some sort of censorship we were also asked not to take photographs of slides those who worked for government agencies pleaded that their comments especially remain unquoted since the forthcoming uk election meant they were living in a state of uh, perda using the Indian word uh, for a widow, a chilling state where severe restrictions on free speech are placed on anyone on the government's payroll. Purda is the burning of the widow after the man dies in India. So so these are a bunch of people that really look, they really feel their options are limited. Why annoyed concern for secrecy and non-attribution, Richard Horton, because this symposium on the reproducibility, just as you mentioned, and reliability of biomedical research held at the Wellcome Trust in last week touched on one of the most sensitive issues in science today, the idea that something has gone fundamentally wrong with one of our greatest human creations. The case against science is straightforward. Much of the scientific literature, perhaps, perhaps half, that's actually an underestimate, may simply be un afflicted by small size, teeny effects, invalid exploratory analyses, flagrant conflict of interest, together with an obsession for pursuing fashionable topics of dubious importance. Really, he means things you can get funding for. Science, <laughs> has, taken, <laughs> science has taken a turn towards darkness. Whoa. Yeah. So um, I love, that's in the introduction of the book. Well, now I feel like this is all behind. I mean, this is the, the, the support of scientific information. Like um, you may, I don't know how much you keep up with stuff, but Gert Vander Bench is probably the preeminent virologist that's shocked by what's going on. And he's a former employee of the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation and can't find his stuff. I mean, it's kicked off. I sent my dad a YouTube with him on an interview and it was already taken off YouTube. And Luke Montagnier, the guy who sequenced the, uh, the HIV and AIDS um, genome, he was kicked off um, YouTube often for just minor things that uh, Gert Vander, um, Vanderbosch is, it was just talking with some science, really totally non-political. It was kind of a uh, real nice, to, you know, it was kind of like then all these people that were listening and commentary uh, comments on the sidebar 
we're like, holy cow, a bunch of angry, you know, Americans and and and, and Europeans too. And like, but these scientists were just like, oh yeah, yeah, the vaccine is killing millions or whatever. <laughs> you know, it's like uh, at any rate, um, uh, so there's censorship, 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 and science is is no longer the science at this point. It's there's we're in for a big um compass adjustment or something here. Yeah. So yeah, so it's like it's it's great that we have we we finally have like scientific validation for all these holistic pl- practices, but then at the same time, whoop de do. <laughs> you know what I mean? We're Most of like censored. like well yeah. like, people don't believe like people are starting to not believe in science anymore. And I think that's even worse yeah. because there's some yeah. real, really wonder I mean wonderful things about it. But it's like the, the people who are, have been using it have been abusing their power and their prestige and for money. Yes. Yeah, it's, it's, right. it's sickening. But it, yeah. and you talk in the book how it's it's like the the medical industry is is about managing disease mm-hmm. rather yep. than curing it. Yep. Yeah. Um, when I was young in the herb store, you know, we learned we were not supposed to say cure or heal. Although you can always use those. If you, in fact, had a case and you're describing it and they got cured of insomnia or something, you know, yeah, walking down the grass cured constipation. Yeah, okay. But uh, so um, you can say that, but you can't say, uh, couldn't really say walk on the grass to get cured of constipation. You can't put it that way. Um, and uh, so the, well, it turns out, after a while, I realized, oh, the doctors can't do that either. They can say, well, statistically, 75% of blah, 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 usually they're all wrong, too. I had a mathematician who got cancer, a friend who got cancer. She was, and she was a woman, so they were lying to her all the time. And, and um, then, and she was like, well, these guys don't even know how to read the, the, the statistics. So even if the statistics are right, the doctors don't even know how to read them some of the time. So um, like, for instance, like the paper, the guy pointed out said, after three years, 7% of the people with your kind of cancer are still alive. Um, well, okay, so she looked at it and it was like, after three years, seven people out of 3000 were still alive. <laughs> like, okay, that's like way less than 1%. So yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but um, uh I think it was six years actually, but um, whatever. But uh, so, you know, the doctor, and this is the doctor giving her advice, like, huh? And, um, and she did way better with Chaga. She had brain cancer, brain tumor, all cancer that metastasized to the brain. We totally kicked it out of the rest of the body. Never had it except in the brain. Uh, she'd had a mastectomy, but I gave her Chaga and that just completely cleared it out of her system. The x-rays showed no tumors anywhere, but she only got x-rayed or MRI from the neck down and it got plus past the blood brain barrier. And I didn't know how to get Chaga past the blood brain barrier, and, but she lived another two years um, and really she would have done fine, but she began to just mentally deteriorate. She was in her mid season, it was a brain tumor. She had three operations and eventually she misunderstood the anesthesiologist said, no, don't take herbs. She stopped taking the chaga and six months later she died. But, you know, the doctor gave her one to two months to live uh, if she did nothing and five months if she got irradiation in the brain and became a vegetable. And um, she did okay for two years, although she was, you know, constantly looking for cures, you know. So so in that sense, it, she didn't enjoy it as much as she have, but Yeah. But, so- has, yeah. has your understanding of the ECM changed the way you think about cancer? Yes. Um, well, I, I never, so I never understood physiology that well because it seemed like it was just standing in the middle of the air with no foundation that ECM gives a foundation. This is what happens from the seawater on up, the organization of life. And then cancer fits into that and uh, I never really felt like I understood cancer, so I, did, I felt uncomfortable taking on case. And indeed, uh, I would say until very recently, we only really had snapshots of different kinds of cancers and not a overall theories or views. And 
the matrix helps provide this view and, and the knowledge of the immune system. I mean, the immune system, we really only began, that only gelled about 2002 or three, that like, uh, last we understand how it works. And so, so first, you know, the immune system, healthy immune system, which does depend on the matrix and other factors. And it, it you know, consumes up the cancer cells. Okay, be developing before they get numerous. Okay, so we have that control, that's a net control, but also the matrix, it turns out, the polymers form, um, well, I mean, not only are they a regulatory system sending signals, they form a, a membrane around a tumor and they, a little, they insist things and uh-huh. that cuts off the material. And it turns out the research shows the cancer is addicted. They need the matrix polymer signals as well, healthy cells. So they get cut off. They're like, what, 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 what happens? Where do we go? Where do we get our food? What do we do? And that the insisting can kill the cancer as well. This is new. This only started research on this in the early 2000s. This is the only area where Pissinger's work has really led to modern changes in big pharma, where they're studying this type of control of cancer through the matrix. Well, they ought to investigate red clover, and until they do, or well, they'll never get it right anyways. But red clover, I mean, this explains how red clover works. Again and again and again, I've seen that it, it insists the tumor, but it doesn't um, necessarily kill the cancer. I've seen two cases like that out of 100, maybe. And I taught this to veterinarians. So I'm talking, they've seen this dozens, hundreds of times themselves, that, that red clover will insist the tumor. That makes easier, better margins when you're a surgeon cutting it out. And also it's containing it, it's not spreading. That means it's better margins, not spreading, not little bills, little bits of cancer cells that got away. So, so red clover, we understand the logic there for red clover that it really can help. Now, um, I don't have much doubt that there, there cancer remedies are acting in other ways. And we have things that increase immune signaling and it may be something like something like reishi. Yeah, you guys can educate me. In fact, I'm I'm a, let the I'm gonna see what you guys think about reishi in the matrix, but but so the signals from the mushrooms are are making the matrix more intelligent and that's helping the cells then the immune cells know how to um, gobble up cancers better. So, so, and then there's other factors that all kind of begin to fit into place. I think I listed 15 factors, 50, and I, I'm sure I didn't get them all. I just tried to get what I could that really began to make more sense for me once I, oh, another thing would be um, faulty manufacture of matrix um, polymers. Um, and, you know, so just giving polysaccharides as a food, mushrooms as a food, because they have so many polysaccharides, even kind of dumb ones, you know, even ones that don't teach much. And, you know, the mucilage in the marshmallow root, I, we don't know how smart or dumb that is, but it's, it's, it's probably influencing some signaling too. And, uh, and as I said, that the polymers make the mortar between the cells in the cell wall, the small intestine. So we're also fighting uh, leaky gut syndrome when we, when we use them. Uh, the mucilages. But what can you guys tell me about reishi and in light? So just in general. Well, I mean, I don't, I don't, I'm not, I'm definitely not an expert on, on this. I'm more of like a plant, like a generalist, you know, okay. um, but I, I mean, I, I've been liking reishi just like just to take every day. And yeah. uh, I mean, it's got the bitterness. Oh, yeah. Uh, it's very bitter. It's got this, the smell is, um, just so unique. So, I mean, yeah, but what do you, do you, what do you? Yeah. I mean, maybe it, it also just helps to control like the free radical cells and tell our cells when they need to, you know, die off. And also there's just all the beta glucans and the fiber too. Like having this mushroom powder, instead of taking the tincture, we're just getting increasing our fiber, um, yeah. taking these mushrooms. And I feel like, I don't know, it just has, um, it affects just the whole body in different ways. I, I've definitely noticed feeling just healthier taking reishi every day for the last few years. Yeah. Well, the other thing is in China, it's the spiritual mushroom. Yeah. You know? right. 
And so the way I see it is it's and, and I, the way I think of my cosmology is, is mostly based on like um, Western occult tradition, you know, esotericism. Yeah. yeah. So I think of in terms of the planes and so Reishi is probably going to the higher plane. And so in that way, it's like helping direct the matrix maybe, you know? Yeah. Ah, yeah. Okay. Yeah. Um, yeah. So it is, yeah, the, I, that's well put spiritual kind of the spiritual mushroom in um, Chinese medicine. And it kind of integrates everything. It seems like the way they talk about like mm, kind of yeah. body, soul, and spirit. Oh, body, soul, and spirit. So that ought to make it a very good remedy for um, after vaccination because, wow, I, this makes so much sense. Um, so one of my friends, uh, she, been, she had a stroke and she had Crohn's disease and I finally stopped that and she's getting better from the stroke, but she goes through quite a bit. So she didn't think about it. She's not up on, you know, the me and, and um, she just got her vaccinations and she said, uh, yeah, but I felt, I feel strange. Like, how do you feel? Cause she's had a stroke. You mean like you feel separate from your body, estranged from your body? Yeah. A strange, do you feel strange from your soul too? Yeah. How about your spirit? Cause she really has a spiritual, I mean, she's someone who's you know, traveled to the center, the center of the galaxy and met people there and met them back in life. And she didn't say you were there too, you know, the, oh, wow. the radiation <laughs> meeting at the center. Of the galaxy. That's, that's way out there. But when you got people that can verify it for each other, that's something. But, but at any rate, so she's very spiritual. So she's, yeah, I, I, yeah, I separated from my spirit too. And um, then that all came back and it's interesting. This is a little bit of news that we found. Um, so horses, she owns a couple of horses. Horses, when people get vaccinated, horses will often not recognize them. And then they get scared of them. They go, they don't want to be around people that have been vaccinated. This isn't permanent. Uh-huh. Right. And in her case, well, and she dreams with the horses and they tell her things and they said, yeah, you're okay now. But they were, they were worried she was going away and they were worried they were going away because she'd had to take one away in a horse trailer. Uh, there were three then there. Now there's only two. So of course, so, you know, she has to dream about this with them and then they, then they're all, oh, we get it. Okay. And they helped her understand she was okay. Now she no longer felt estranged, but, but that reminds me of Rishi that alienation from, you know, body, my spirit, which, you know, all, yeah, yeah I'm, I, Western occultism is my training too. And I, I just translated it into, I prefer to call it shamanism, which is what it is. But as you know, you know, body, soul, and spirit really is women in, in the in that world, in in our teachings. So yeah, yeah. yeah so so that- now, now I'm I'm kind of inspired here. I think if one herb would would really help, uh, one mushroom that might be it. So yeah, I mean, I I, I think it's just it's like the the king mushroom. I mean. Yeah. reishi and chaga together i we're lucky oh. that we have so much reishi and chaga around here like we live in northern hardwoods so we have yeah. lots of birch lots of hemlock yeah. um so we have easy access to it and we're you know there's lots of it around but it is all they're also you know it's they, they are starting to like grow reishi you know they grow reishi um but I still feel like getting it from the, the wild is, is a little bit better, but this, this, this is um, bringing things to my mind about like, for me, like a, a lot of the, what I've been hearing of side effects from the vaccine is like myocarditis and like heart problems, you know, bl- blood clotting. So what do you think, like, if, if we're going to be seeing this kind of stuff more often, like how, how can we help remedy that? Yeah, like for instance, my brother's wife got um, um, she got uh, showed up test just a month ago with a thrombocytopenia. That's a well-known side effect of um, uh, of being uh, vaccinated, and that's uh, um, your your uh, your thrombocytes, your clotting cells are disordered. So your so they you know, one down to, you know, what, I don't know, horrible drugs. The other one said, I'll just take baby aspirin, you know? Well, so there, so that's kind of, so we've known about that for a long time in herbal medicine. There's many things that thin the blood. Some of, some Mm -hmm. things almost imperceptibly, like I'd actually say that's true of red clover and uh, certainly the containing um, herbs and they do get past the small, small blood uh, barrier, blood barrier. And, and you do see from a little bit of blood thinning from 
from some of those, um, from even maybe not cleavers, but but that uh, you know. So so those are our most gentle blood thinners, and then but we have lots of blood thinners, and and some blood thinning. I would say, well, so there's a lot of overlap between COVID and the vaccine, and I did find a fair number of people benefited from like Angelica or or some type of warming herbs. Other ones needed. Um, cooling herbs and that you, you, if you're going to be an herbalist, you got to get, that's the most important difference. Get down hot and cold and then damp and dry. Because if you give someone who's hot, a hot herb, they'll really feel it. And that could be really bad. And on the other hand, if you give them a cooling herb um, when they need, when they're too hot, that can, that can save their life. Like if I may give an example, I think I gave it, well, I gave it somewhere recently, but yeah, a friend of mine's husband, yeah, he had he had been vaccinated, but then they got COVID, hospitalized four days. And he was really sick, but and then he came out and he was his tongue was red and parched and and dried out and he was thirsty and was really in bad shape and and uh, still hot in the forehead and stuff. I don't know if he still actively had COVID or just was like the side effects. He'd been so burned out, and so I said when I was in the woods up north and a telephone call with her up in Upper Michigan there. And, and and so I didn't have I couldn't really call them. I said, well, we'll just um, like get a whole bunch of peaches and just c- cooling moistening because of red dry tongue. And he he ate peaches and peaches and cherries too, but peaches mostly. And that totally turned around. And she said said you saved his life. You know, like whoa. You know, I I don't think that that saved him from the COVID or the vaccine or whatever. It it was the after effect because. But, but maybe he still had COVID, I don't know. But, but so a lot of the time for the vaccine, but what's gonna help break up, well, spikes, you know, so I was thinking just from my doctor and signature, the only thing that's hit me kind of intuitively, psychically has been uh, the agrimony and um, yarrow as a combination. And, and in addition, like ag- agrimony kind of works out kinks in the nervous system. You get a lot of kinks in the, the autonomic, that's what I noticed personally when I had it. Um, like it deranged my, well, it was constantly my throat hitting my uh, vagus nerve there. It passed out of my body. Finally, I got the slow breathing and the slow down and heart rate, and then it passed. And um, that's the vagus uh, nerve tied into the, the brain stem. Yeah. But um, so, so I'd say, yeah, uh, uh, autonomic nervous system, get that in better shape for both these things. And then, the, um, and that would be Nigella helped me, Lobelia might help somebody. Um, and what was I thinking now for, I was else in there, but, but uh, deep nervines um, and because uh, the autonomic is the unconscious nervous system. So, so sometimes you need to, yeah, some people have needed a uh, skull cap and things like that. Um, Let's see. Yeah, skull cap actually is a good COVID remedy. But these warming peripheral circulation remedies often thin the blood too. Like turmeric might be in there and that's anti-inflammatory, but it is warming. So if you need a warming remedy when somebody has an infection, it means usually there's a lot of breakdown material that you got to stimulate the body. You need a stimulant. You need something to warm it to get rid of that metabolic waste products and bacteria feeding off it and stuff like that sometimes. Uh, so there can be heat from cold, but heat from heat, that's autoimmune excess. That's what the guy with the peaches, what he had. Uh, so there's just opposites there and you, and you develop a sense of it better and better. Like a real red hot tongue like that, he would not need a warming remedy, obviously. Even turmeric, even an anti-inflammatory warming remedy. So, you know, other, yeah, yeah, we have other gentle blood thinners too, but if they're on aspirin, then kind of the doctor got there first and, and that's questionable. Then we got to use very mild, well, I, I would count yarrow there too. Yarrow breaks up, breaks up clots and sage, they break up clots, but also they form clotting. They normalize the blood. Oh, okay. Like, yeah. That, okay. Yeah. yeah that one. Yeah. So there's my ideas there. Okay. Yeah. Thank so, you. That, that definitely. Cause it is very important. Like, yeah, to know they're, yeah. you know, if they're hot or cold. <laughs> yeah. 
<laughs> right. right. You want to, to yeah. off, make them even more off balance. Yeah. So this yeah. is one thing that is interesting to me um, is how the ECM is kind of like, and you talked about this a little bit. It's kind of like um, the etheric body. Would yeah. You, would you, would you say that um, that's what it like in a way that's like the physical manifestation of the etheric body or the um, electromagnetic um, frequencies, the happening in the ECM maybe? Yeah. And so Pissinger and he, they got together with some anthroposophical doctors like in the 1980s and had a little discussion and, and they kind of concluded jointly the two sides uh, that that's what, that the matrix or perhaps the ground regulatory system working in the matrix, that that's like the equivalent of the etheric body. It's, we'd say maybe the physical level of the etheric body. And then when you do consider how sensitive it's turning out that this all is to e EMFs, uh, yeah, that begins to justify it more and more. So, um, so energy healing, like when we say, yeah, when we, so, you know, the intuition, you see the whole picture, but that's still more intellectual, I'd say, you know, even though it's mystical, but when you trust your animal instincts, which is shamanism, when you trust your animal instincts, that's more, your closer to your energy body. I would say that's instinct and that tunes into this. The matrix is really kind of like the plant body, but plants, they personify an energy pattern kind of throughout their whole life. So they don't change as much as animals. And But in that kind of interaction there between the animal and the plant, you get the energy shift. You get the, oh, I feel that, you know? And like, you know, like when something, it's the basic animal insight, safe, unsafe, you know? Start with that and then you keep going and um you know that develops into more and more uh, uh you know knowledge uh, and on that energy body level that's where for dream time that's where things are remembered in dream and stuff and that's one thing about COVID. i found it changes your dreaming it's really profound in that way huh. so yeah so regarding energy healing, like Reiki or maybe like plant spirit medicine, we're using like the, the energy. Do you think that's working on the ECM? Yeah. Um, still, when you're using plant spirit medicine, you're still getting the essence of the plant, which is like the archetype. Yeah, the archetype probably works through the etheric level, through the energy level to right. control things, to like, you know, you you your the liver you liver are like a manifestation of my essence whatever i'm i'm liver energy in the universe and they're chelidonium and um, dandelion root and they're all manifesting different acts of the liver and milk thistle and um you know there i don't know that there's one plant that does it all maybe maybe hepatica <laughs> but, uh, <laughs> Which you have plenty of up there, although that hasn't been used in herb commerce for 150 years. But but um, but it's got the name, and it once was used for the liver. But um, so there's liver essence, you know. So that's that archetypal aspect, and then there's the energy aspect, which is more free floating. Does not that's how energy healing need not to that archetype. But I think the two together are very powerful, and that maybe explains homeopathic remedies why you know if the wrong remedy nothing happens but boy when you get the right remedy it's like holy cow you know it's it's like our lady of lords or something i, I was thinking of that i was like yeah. oh, this is as impressive as any you know healing at some mystical shrine or something mm. yeah. <laughs> so, so do you think there is like it seems like the ecm is the best way for a like material reductionist to understand holistic healing but at the same time like there are levels above that too. Do, do you think it's possible to ha find like um, w w using science, how like a mechanism for how uh, the, the more spiritual kinds of healing happen? Or do you ha just have to change your worldview? Yeah, on some level, I think there is some sort of, yeah. Well, first of all, see, don't accept that EMs have any major impact. They may be a little bit of it they're willing to uh, think, but not very much. And they, they've really suppressed this all, all along. I got to make money 
but just the bias of modern mind is like, oh no, electricity does not influence us. And it, strangely, one of the things that displaced it was was Freudian psychology, like, huh. oh, it's in their heads. Now we can say it's in their heads. You know, they didn't think it before. And um, that's when the whole reading from Arthur Furstenberg, when that whole, when the whole idea of electricity causing disease disappeared was banned. Um, Freudian psychology is really important and it's, and it actually agrees it's got the three selves, body, mind, and spirit, id, ego, and um, well, super ego is like the fake spirit, whatever we imagine the spirit is, but it's got those three selves and Therefore, yeah. it's really important. It's changed society a great deal. And, but that was one unforced side effect that they discounted EMFs. Well, first thing they've got to do is start counting EMFs. And once they do that, then they'll be able to see, oh, what would you say? Um, you know, that sine waves, that waves translate easily to the physical level. And then we pretty much open up the whole esoteric door. Maybe they're unconsciously aware of that. And that's one more reason they have banned that, you know, and, and yet I mean, you know, radiation, there's just so much rays affect us, invisible rays. It's like, yeah, it's all just paper cattle that's gonna fall down. <laughs> so. When, like when people don't believe in science, you know, I mean, they're going to have a hard time. I mean, this stuff's going to come out about how abused. I mean, big pharma has caused millions of deaths or hundreds of thousands of deaths in the United States, et cetera, from, from mistreatment of COVID for, because remdesivir actually, the evidence is it actually killed people, a great number of them. And they suppressed ivermectin and hydroxychloroquine in order to, yeah, and bring on the vaccines and the vaccines have killed, I mean, they find first two months, um, even with doctors suppressing the reports, um, 14,000 um, deaths from uh, from uh, a vaccine from the Pfizer being reported back to Pfizer, 14,000. Well, I mean, any would be taken off the market, you know, and uh, it's not much different with Moderna. I, I don't know. The facts aren't in on J and J. I hope that was bad because most of my friends have been forced to take a vaccine or anti-vaxxers took J and J. So, yeah. but um, yeah. So, and I haven't heard exactly bad. I mean, it doesn't have the spike spike protein in it. But at any rate, um, yeah. Okay. Uh, I forgot. So. Well, yeah. So maybe we should go on to, um, but did we talk about tensegrity enough? Uh, we, we put it in there. Well, um, yeah, Don Ingber, I-N-G-B-E-R. There's some YouTubes with that information. There's a book by a Canadian naturopath and uh, I haven't seen it. I think I ordered it, but um, naturopath and chiropractor uh, fitting this view of the matrix. This is a different view of the matrix yeah. from these guys, in the, but Dr. Roth, George Roth. Uh, but you may want to watch, people may want to watch the, the Ingber um, things online. And so those really um, supplement my work because this is a major thing that I wasn't aware of because he wasn't aware of Pissinger and Heine. I mean, he didn't realize that, that the matrix justifies holism. You know, he's just... Yeah. But, but he's working, you know, people would call, you know, the tens gritty of a part of holism in a way too. So the two should meet. Yeah. But um, I'll put the links. Ahead. I'll put the links in the show notes. Uh, about that yes. Good. Videos. Good. Okay. Yeah. Right. Yeah. I, I did want to say, so you asked me just before we got going, what plants did I really come to understand better yeah. from the, the EMC? One was, red clover and certainly the mushrooms fit in here but and all the mucilages mm -hmm. all of them i became it's like they're oh, not just stuffing yeah, <laughs> or, like it's not like a spackle stuffing. like your spackle yeah. like, oh. there are at least telephone wires if not actual messages you know mm -hmm. so that was important but the herb that really i understood one that uh, that popped into my mind like whoa 
Oh, now I understand how chickweed works. Like, because uh -huh. chickweed's a great detoxifier from the surface. Oh, gee, I just saw a lot of chickweed down the down the driveway here where I'm staying. Oh, oh, oh I got to get it. <laughs> wow. Um, I'm, I'm going to set up a yeah, I, I always write on my hand or something in order to remember something. I might, forget. but yeah. So chickweed, like use it externally. It could draw. Say you have, um, or you just have, uh, or some sort of skin rash or something. It draws out heat, and it draws out it. Right. It seems to. I think it modif it um. What would you call it? Modulates, normalizes between damp and dry. And a friend of mine believed that it normalized between water and oil, and that it's good for the cell membrane. And she's much of a of a person to say things like that. That's just somehow it came to her, and and I'm willing to. That's quite possible. But and and that would explain why it is a great alternative. It can be used internally for the liver and so on, which works on that water and oil thing together. Okay, so putting the, 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 that's a salve that really works well. People say, oh, it makes my skin itch. Well, tell them to save it and take it when the skin itches, not when it doesn't itch. <laughs> it's just draw out. It's just drawing stuff out and um, uh, bringing it to the surface and it's going to cause an itch sometimes. But so that was an herb that it's like, wow, this is a great remedy for the matrix in local areas. So, yeah. Cool. Yeah, so uh, and, yeah, did your understanding okay. of alternatives in general change? Well, yes. Okay, so I quoted Bergner uh, about 2000. He, uh, you know, and uh, he was not thinking in terms of what Pissinger and Heine, that, that was not published in English yet, or the tense gritty stuff to any great extent. So he's just thinking, okay, we have... Um, What's, what's bad blood? What's dirty blood? Where would the toxins? I mean, it, it, our model works really well. And it's like, okay, if we increase the metabolism, we burn off a bunch of junk. I mean, this really is what it looks like is happening. So dandelion, burdock, uh, uh, yeah, red clover, um, yellow dock root uh, are great alternatives. Um, nettles opening the kidneys a little bit more. And um, uh where would that, where would the toxins really be building up? They'd be building up in the matrix. That's where they build up, not in the, not in the blood, not even in the lymph. The lymph and the blood are very clean. They're buffered. They're cleaned out, white cells, etc. Certainly not in the cerebral spinal fluid. So no other fluid left over except the seawater that around the cells. And, um, that's undoubtedly where the where this builds up. Well, one of the so so that's already kind of a mind-boggling, you know. That means well, we're justified in our idea, you know, of alternatives. Then a second thing was when I read uh, that boggled my mind. The Japanese um, researcher he was really talking about diabetes, but he explained how the matrix goes from acid to alkaline, to acid to alkaline, to acid to alkaline. Because different enzymes need different levels of acidity or alkalinity to work. So it's constantly fluctuating. So, so you eat something more acid, less acid, whatever. The blood is buffered, but but it shows up in on that level um, that, uh, or whether it's eating or, it's, I don't know how, what the mechanism is. He didn't explain it, but it may not be known. It's very hard to measure, he said, but there's a constant fluctuation acid alkaline. Well, now this... So therefore, this also defies not only the alternative model, but the whole acid alkaline that you could be too acidic or too alkaline. And that would be because of the debris in your matrix. And uh, I do believe you can influence um, acid alkaline just with foods and herbs and stuff. I, I'm not going to go into that too much. To, uh, wait for my book on the cell salts and the, and the minerals, acid alkaline. But uh, um, oh. I'll, I'll, I'll try to get you guys a copy of that. Uh, to, uh, we could we could do a program on that, okay? Yeah, yeah that would be really fun. Definitely. Okay. Yeah, I will send you my manuscript on that, and then we can get on the same page. And I don't have it as cool. memorable as this. <laughs> I mean, yeah. I think both just said cool at the same time. Well, yeah, we've been doing the, the cell salt protocol, um, and it's been really yeah. interesting because I hadn't really heard of them before. Um, yeah. 
And John Michael Greer posted about this this old um, doctor and astrologer George yeah. Washington Perry, who yeah. did full uh, cell salt protocol with um, your, your your sun sign basically. Like he was positing that since there are twelve cell salts and a, a baby is is takes nine months to be born, you're missing like three of them. You know, so you take those three, oh, wow. whenever your moon, oh, wow. your moon is in your sun sign. And it's, it's so, yeah, like every, <laughs> every month when the moon is in Capricorn, I have to take these extra cell salts for those oh. days or whatever. Yeah. It's interesting. Oh. Yeah. I didn't know about that. Let's see. Yeah. If you could see where that's posted, um, and, or yeah. just posting itself, I'd like to see that. Yeah. 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 I think with a little skill, one could get. Um, more and more exact. Uh, I, I would say the the 12 signs of the zodiac and the 12 salts leave a little to be desired. There are definite kinks in that system, but also things that work like um, like the the Capricorn cell salt, sodium phosphate. That's, a, a, yeah, not, no, uh, it's calcium phosphate. That is a great remedy for the bones and the marrow and uh, yeah. the uh, Capricornian structures. But but I have to say, um, calcium fluoride, the opposite, that acts a lot. That's the cancer cell salt. That acts on well, those two are together. So it's, it's yeah. kind of Capricorn, even though it's a. Yeah, well, me, you know, me, I'm, I'm a cancer son, and AC is a Capricorn son. So. Yeah, that's when you say that. Oh. oh, that's the perfect. Yeah, that's what Yeah, Jung found. Jung studied, uh, he was too fascinated by it. He was trying not to let everybody use an astrologer, but he studied. And he would, oh, it was often um, sun to moon worked, but but often in parts because, you know, a relationship, a marriage is partnership. And, and often those things are necessary just to, you know, it's like they augment each other. So good, you guys. Yeah. Yeah, <laughs> definitely. Since that. So is there yeah. anything, is there anything else that um, you want to cover before we wrap up this interview? Is there anything, any burning thoughts? Yeah, I can't think of anything. Um, uh, I guess we'd say the book is published by Inner Traditions. Yeah. And the holistic, uh, holistic medicine and the extracellular matrix, they stuck in the science of healing at the cellular level. Uh, I didn't like that totally because it's not cellular healing, it's matrix right. healing. Yeah. And, right, right. <laughs> They still can't quite get it. Well, it yeah, also, I just have to read the book better. <laughs> makes it a really long title too. Yeah, but yeah, it, it is a great. Yeah. Book. yeah, thank you. Yeah, I honestly, like I've never oh. taken so many notes reading a book before. Like preparing for this podcast, like I didn't even try doing like a linear list of things. I just have like a bubble mind map of all these like popcorn ideas, and <laughs> it was just yeah, like I'm blowing my mind at every page. You know. I know. Yes. Yeah. When, so I had forgotten that when it, you know, after you write it, you turn it in, you, you have to proofread it and proofread it and proofread it. You're tired of it. It's like, finally it comes out. Finally, finally, they say it's going to come out in October. No, no, November, uh, later November. You know, <laughs> it was like, oh, finally it came out. Oh my God. And no, you forget, but people said it's really blown my mind. And then I thought, oh my God, a lot of that stuff blew my mind when I came across it and yeah. not just on the matrix, but when you put the matrix together with Pollock, that's mind blowing. Yeah. When you put it together with the porphyrins and the EMFs, that's mind blowing. And what is it you just mentioned there? The, well, and the cancer that's mind blowing and the, the um, alternatives, the Paul yeah. Bergner's idea, that's mind blowing. And the, and the acid alcohol, that's mind blowing. <laughs> <laughs> it just goes on and on. And, and then when I, I love that um, International Herb Symposium, I recommend everybody that if to get a copy of that, that was from last week, last Wednesday or the Wednesday, last Wednesday only, I think, yeah. or the Wednesday before. But um, I, that was the only time I just let herbalists ask all the questions they wanted. And like, there was like 60 things people thought of that I hadn't <laughs> thought of. <laughs> I say, you got it. I can't answer that. They were like, they were <laughs> to me, like, I would like, knew all about it and and i'm like i just barely i mastered this to write the book now now you guys got to keep on going on so what's exciting about this book is that anybody who thinks at all and any herbalist with you're gonna see all sorts of patterns and ideas and things and like what makes sense and i i'll bet you that there's 
mushroom people that'll see some patterns in the matrix, um, you know, oh, that makes sense. And I hope we develop more and more knowledge of exactitude with the, the mushrooms. Yeah. 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 Mm-hmm. yeah. We'll have to have some more mushroom people on and ask them questions. Yeah. Yeah. And I should, let's say, I should advertise my Matthew Wood Institute of Herbalism. And I have classes there and uh, we're trying to get together basic program. Oh, I will be in New York in your area. Yeah. I want to let you know. So yes, in I'll be in uh, Rosendale down in like it's Ulster or Orange County down that way. And yeah. it is a class, it's a class being organized by um, holistic grants. They're not, they're not vaccinated. So I said, well, well, I haven't been vaccinated. I hope that's not a problem. He said, well, we haven't been vaccinated either. So I will be in your area. I'll also be teaching at, uh, you know, um, Claudia and Richard School down um, uh, Arbor Vitae uh, in um, in New York. Uh-huh. Yeah, um, and I may teach somewhere else, but but uh, I will be out there in April of next year. You know, cool. God and COVID providing. You know, God yeah. providing COVID. <laughs> God uh, and COVID, <laughs> same thing. <laughs> like same level. <laughs> God and Mother Nature together. <laughs> yeah. Uh, oh, well, you're okay welcome. you're welcome to come stop by the homestead if you wanted to we yeah. have a little guest oh. room and- <laughs> oh, oh great yeah i yeah. yeah i have friends in upstate new york and stuff yeah so i may take you up on that yeah Aww. so okie doke yeah this has been great well, thank you so much for being on the on the show yeah thank you well we'll see ya or talk right. to you again thanks yep. bye, bye.